Welcome to our Truth to Live by podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. In this podcast, you will hear the verse-by-verse teaching and preaching of Pastor Kevin Nakana. You can learn more about our church from our website at windwardbaptist.org. During that 70-week prophecy, or the 70-week the prophecy of Daniel, at the beginning of that prophecy, and it's in your notes, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. What people? Israel. Prophecy is centered on Israel. If you get Israel wrong, you will get prophecy wrong. There are a lot of people that think, and they believe in replacement theology, and they, they believe that the church replaces Israel, and so now their prophecy is all diluted, and it's all messed up. And usually most of them are all millennialist. We are not all millennialist. We are pre-millennialist. What does that mean? We take revelation literal. We believe prophecy is for us to point people to Christ because we know it's going to happen in the future. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, that's Israel, and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. There's a starting point of this prophecy. It's in the days of Nehemiah for the commandment to rebuild the walls, right? From that point on, there's going to be a specific time period that's going to take you all the way to the bringing in of everlasting righteousness. That means the title deed is reclaimed. That means the the debt has been paid, and it's been paid by Jesus Christ. The title deed is reclaimed by Jesus Christ, where we are going to rule and reign with him. Remember that Adam and Eve, when Adam is in the garden, he was given that opportunity. He was placed in the Garden of Eden, and he was given dominion over it, and he forfeited it. So the way it was back then, when he forfeited it, in a sense, is the way it's going to be in the millennial kingdom where they walked with God in the garden, right? We're going to be with him forever and ever. It's going to be back to its Edenic type of conditions. And um, Adam, who lost it, now Jesus Christ is the second Adam, and he's going to reclaim it. But in between, before he reclaims it, the scroll has to be rolled out, and the list stated of the payment that has to be paid and the things that have to happen, and that's the tribulation period. Once that's done, we're going to see in the end of the tribulation period in chapter 19, then it's going to be the millennial kingdom. So that's what we're talking about. So this prophecy takes you all the way from the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. That's in verse 25. Know, ye, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. A score is 20. Three scores, how much? 60. Two weeks makes it how much? 62. Plus the seven weeks. So that makes it how much? 69. So 60 plus two, and it's also given a division of the seven the, the 49 years or the seven weeks, for whatever re- reason, he singles that part out. The rebuilding of the wall took that long. And so, but altogether, it takes you from that commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Jesus comes is going to be 69 weeks. And he's going to be cut off. And then there's the church age. How long does the church age last? Anybody knows? It has been that, but it, it's lasted 2,000 plus years. But when is it going to end? What date? Anybody knows? Someone online got their hands raised. At the rapture. rapture. Good answer. We don't know when it's going to end, but we know it's going to end with the rapture. If you take the book of Revelation literal, you have a rapture in it. Chapter 2 and 3 is about the? About the what? Church. Oh, yeah. Chapter 4, verse 1. Come up hither. Right? And so from chapter 4 and 5, we're in the throne room, right? Church is up here on earth. Meanwhile, back on planet earth, (laughs) chapter 6 through 19. So the church age, chapter 2 and 3, is basically a a, a period of time. We don't know when it's going to end, but it ends at the rapture. After the rapture, what event is going to start the tribulation? What begins it? What event's going to happen? Someone's going to do something, and that's going to start the clock ticking. 
the prophetic clock. The Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel, a seven-year covenant. Correct. Now, I'm going this over and over and over this again because this, we need to know this for prophecy. You need to know the, the, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel is the most powerful and important prophecy in the Bible because it covers, for, I mean, the whole span of time. And then it spells out the, what's going to happen during the tribulation period. The Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel for seven years. In fact, Jeremiah, I believe it's Jeremiah, that refers to this as the covenant. Anyone knows what it's called? The covenant with death and the covenant with hell. After three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself, and the people of the, of the prince shall, shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so the, the Messiah was cut off, not for himself, because he was crucified for us, and then the people of the prince, that's talking about the Romans, they destroy the, the, um, the temple. They destroy Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. And then it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He's going to stop temple worship. And he's going to go into the temple. And he's going to set up himself to be worshipped. Jesus calls that the abomination of desolation. And then from that point on to the rest of the tribulation period, it's going to be very bad. And for the overspreading of abom abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, that's the very end, and that, determ and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, so now we are on the second seal. We are on chap um, chapter 6, verse 3, the red horse. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. So peace is taken. And they that should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So the rider doesn't need to bring war and dis destruction. All he needs to do is take peace away. Now, remember what I said this morning? That... um. What we're going to talk about is what event... Now, I'm not saying this dogmatically. I'm not saying 100% for sure. But a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of theologians believe that this could be the case. And this may be the event that brings the Antichrist to Jerusalem. Now, remember, he makes a peace treaty with them, right? A covenant. So he's saying, I'll protect you. Someone messes with you, they mess with me. I'll back you up. No one does that with Israel hardly nowadays, right? So the Antichrist is going to do that. So there's going to be a war. Some people believe that this war is going to happen right around the midpoint of the tribulation period. We don't know for sure, but we know that there's a peace, right? A, a peace, that a false sense of peace. So remember, there's peace, right? A false sense of peace, and then now there's going to be war. Peace will be taken away. Some people believe this could be the Ezekiel 38-39 war. So turn to Ezekiel 38. I'm not going to go through the whole thing for the sake of time. Ezekiel 38, it says, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. This is modern-day Russia. And the chief prince of Meshech, some people believe this is Moscow, and Tubal, Turkey, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech, and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses with horsemen. Do you know Russia? Is one of the few armies that still uses horses. All of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them hand, handling swords. Persia, Iran, Ethiopia, northern Africa area, and Lib Libya, that same region. With them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, Gomer parts of Turkey. And all his bands, or, no, I think actually Gomer is um, southern Russia area, 
Tagarma, Turkey, and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. The, the land that is brought back, the, the land there was so much fighting over Israel all these years, and now it's brought back, 1948, they became a nation again. And is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations. There were Jews scattered throughout the world to almost every single nation of the world. And they are brought back. And they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind. Thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, I went to Israel twice, and I was never, I never had any fear. I'm telling you, when we went to Israel, you hear how, how dangerous it is, right? Some people don't want to go because it's so dangerous. When we went to Israel, our guide said, you will not find it to be the way you've heard it to be. When you go to Jerusalem, I mean, all over Israel, with the exception of being near Gaza or in the northern area, Syria or, you know, you stay away from those because that's where the missiles are flying in, right? But aside from that, even then, they, they intersect all the missiles, the Iron Dome of Israel. The ones that don't, they don't intersect, a lot of times they see it as it's not going to hit anything anyway, so they let it go. But he said this, would you let your children play in the streets? Or well, not in the streets, but you know, would you let them go out into the neighborhoods in, uh, let's say, any of the modern main cities in the, of the United States, like Chicago or L.A., at... Midnight? No. We wouldn't even go let them out there at 6, six o'clock. He says, you can let your children play outside at midnight, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the morning in any major city of Israel, including Jerusalem, and they will be perfectly safe. You wouldn't have to fear them being kidnapped or harmed in any way. He said, I promise you. You know what? I felt like that. I mean, I didn't have my children with me. Uh, not that I would have let, you know. <laughs> of course, Casey can take care of himself. <laughs> but we went out and we went walking around. The, the person that I was with, Pastor Paul, we went walking around Israel, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, probably 1230. We just walked around, tried to go to the darkest alleys or whatever. We did not one time feel unsafe. Of course, Pastor Paul's like 6'4", but <laughs> he's a big guy. But even outside of that, I remember doing that, and I, was, I remember going, to, going walking the streets of Chicago with August, who was a big guy. You know, and, and I remember walking in L.A. We heard a sound like this, Pah! and everybody ducked, and we're like, <laughs> everyone around us that lives there just ducked. And this was like 2, 3 in the afternoon. <laughs> we didn't go walking around too much after that in L.A., near L.A., but in Israel, it's totally safe. It's a, and the people there feel safe. Now, it wasn't that this way a little while ago. We went to this one place. It's like a downtown, like if you're in downtown Honolulu. We went to a place that was that type of place in Israel. It was a real fun place to be. You had people doing like a, a lot of the, um, you had some Orthodox Jews playing music. You know, they, they had all their, you know, their, their or, uh, Orthodox garb on. And they were playing music, like they had like an organ, and they were playing different instruments, and they were dancing. And there were people just dancing right around at the, like, uh, um, uh, uh, area right in town square, like in the center. And they were all dancing and laughing and having fun. No one was fighting. No one was, you know, like in Hawaii, you go to a gathering, and pretty soon you're like, what, wait, wait, what, 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 what? And you got all people fighting. <laughs> you, no one was fighting. Everyone was having a good time. The children were playing and laughing, and I thought, Man, this is so neat to see this. 
you had all of these restaurants and the sidewalks, and people were sitting outside of the restaurant. It was a nice um, evening. The, the weather was nice. And people was just, it just had a good spirit. I mean, you had, I mean, Jews, you had um, Palestinians, or you had different ethnic groups, and everyone just was having a great time. And so we, ha- we met somebody there that was from there. He was actually an um, Ethiopian Jew. And he was telling us that years ago there's been a lot of bombings over here, but now it's not like that. And, yeah, we haven't had anything like that. You know, they started taking some certain safety precautions, and now it, it was very safe. And you could, you could tell everyone felt safe. So I can see what it's saying in, in a way here, that it's us, people feel safe. There's, when you walk in the ancient, the old, old um, Jerusalem town, you see, I mean, you'll see a lot of the police, they're, they're loaded down. I mean, they got big guns, they got guns all over them. And they're just marching around. There's not going to be any mass shootings. If, if it's going to be very short-lived if someone, you know, because there's just... And then a lot of people, do you have people carrying, open carry? I mean, they carry, I mean, I don't know what all the rules are there, but we saw people carrying. And um, it's just a safe, it just feels safe. So it says in, in uh, Ezekiel 38, if you go to, where was I? Oh, yeah, verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Now, Israel is a rich country right now, a very, a very wealthy country. Militarily, they have one of the top militaries in the world, like at least they're, they're in the top five, I believe. Economically, I mean, they're one of the wealthiest nations in the world. They're the highest exporters of flowers in, uh, to, to Europe, and they're just a country the size of Colorado, and not just um, flowers, but also uh, fruits and vegetables. I mean, they produce, I think they're one of the top three or four producers of um, fruits and vegetables in Europe. I mean, they're a very wealthy, abundant country. God has definitely blessed them. If Israel is God's chosen people, and you have all of these countries around about them that are, have so much oil, right? And yet Israel doesn't seem like they have that, many, that much oil. Well, guess what? A few years ago, they discovered a whole bunch of natural gas and oil in the Mediterranean on their side, on their area. They've got so much oil, they don't even know what to do with it. They have a lot. So right now, as we speak, they've made a, an agreement with Egypt and Saudi Arabia and other countries that these countries who get their oil from Russia, now Russia's main export is oil. And if they are not able to sell their oil, then they are going to go broke. I mean, they are going to have some significant economic problems. Big time. And a lot of the wars, that, a lot of the battles that go on in that area of the world is over oil. And who gets to sell it and who's buying it and this and that. So Israel is now going to, they're making a pipeline that's supposed to be completed. It's supposed to be completed in 2025. Now it's extended, I think, to 2027. But they're making this pipeline. They're already selling and exporting this oil, but they're making this pipeline that is going to go directly to Egypt and to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia right now, even though they're they're Islamic, they are pretty cool with Israel. They even wished them happy Hanukkah this past um, year, maybe a couple years already. So they already have a good relationship, better than before. So they're starting to make these trade deals, because they know that whoever has a, a good dealings with Israel, is all, they're always better off. And if you th- look at Jordan, Jordan is starting to um, make some agreements with Israel, and Israel is teaching them some of the things that they do when it, when it comes to tourism, um, when it comes to extracting some natural resources out of the Dead Sea and other things. Oh, and not only that, a lot of this oil is going to be exported to Europe. Who do you think supplies Europe with a lot of this oil? It's Russia. So Russia is going to be very upset if now all Israel has to do is say, well, how much is Russia selling the oil for? 
Well, we can sell it to you a whole lot cheaper. Do you think Russia is going to sit back? Just let that happen? So something is going to cause them to want to come down and invade Israel. Now, we've always backed Israel. With President Trump, he was one of the, uh, he, he was a president that was a friend to Israel. And he probably backed Israel more than most presidents of the United States have. And Benjamin Netanyahu said that. He was one of the greatest friends of Israel than any other president. And, but he's no longer the president. And we know that right now we're starting to not be so friendly with Israel as we used to be. I know Obama wasn't, President Obama. But so something it says like hooks in their jaws is going to bring them down. And it says in verse 12, to take a spoil. Take off the S and the P. What do you got? Oil. Oil. <laughs> it could be that they're coming for the oil. To take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. They're all scattered, now they're in Israel again, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan. That's, um, Sheba is Ethiopia or um, Yemen. And Dedan is Saudi Arabia, unto the merchants of Tarshish, Spain, and Europe area, with all the young lions thereof. Actually, Tarshish could be England, and the young lions could be us. We don't know. Shall say unto thee, Are thou come to take a spoil? These are the only countries that are going to question. Hast thou gathered th thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So they protested, but nobody did anything. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God in that day, When my people of Israel dwell safely, shall thou know it. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days." And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days, many years, that I would bring thee against them, and it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel." Said the Lord God that my fury shall come upon my face. So there's going to be a northern coalition of the nations that I just mentioned. There's going to be a southern coalition. A lot of people believe that this is going to be a lot of the Islamic countries like Turkey, like northern Africa, like Iran. And they're going to come together against Israel for the spoil. For, of course, you know a lot of these um, Islamic countries want to destroy Israel, and God is going to supernaturally destroy this army. It says, For in my jealousy, verse 19, and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in the day that there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every one shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I'll be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And he is going to destroy these nations, and that's it. Some people believe that this will be the end of Islam, because the ones that remain are going to understand that they had this jihad and all, and all of that, and they were defeated, and they were destroyed, and so a lot of them are going to turn their eyes, uh, they're going to turn to the Lord. Maybe so. So it says in chapter 39 that these nations are going to be, and for the sake of time, I'll just tell you, chapter 39, these nations are going to be destroyed, and it's talking about cleanup, and a lot of the descriptions in this cleanup, it almost seems like there's nuclear fallout. Could this be a nuclear war, that Israel sends nuclear missiles, um, and they're just destroyed, 
and then the fallout, because the way they clean it up, they have to put a sign there, and then the people that have the, you know, the garb on to deal with it, they put a sign that there's a body here, and they would clean it. And so it's going to be a, a long time period to clean everything up. So this battle right here, remember now, when these nations come against Israel, who's the ally? So the beast, the Antichrist, he is the head of a... Of the revived Roman Empire. In Daniel, in the book of Daniel, in the statue with the ten toes, it's a revived Roman Empire that will be headed up by the Antichrist. So Rome, remember Rome was a world ruler when Jesus was on this earth? And then, of course, Rome got defeated by the, um, all these barbaric tribes like the, the Goths, the Visigoths, and the Lombards, and the, all these Viking tribes came. And before you know, Rome had fallen and so Rome has not been, there hasn't been a world power in that same way since Rome. But there's going to be a revived Roman Empire that's going to be headed up by the Antichrist. So now the Antichrist and his armies are going to protect Israel because they made that covenant. So when these armies come against Israel, they're coming too. That's what I believe is going to bring the Antichrist to Jerusalem. This event. And of course, they're going to be all defeated and so now you got the Antichrist there, and it's at this time, a lot of people believe, like I said, I don't want to be too dogmatic, but he's going to be there in Israel, and that's when he is going to turn on them. Now, one more verse, and then we'll finish this outline here, or one more uh, passage. Daniel chapter 11, it speaks of something, and this may be what it's referring to. Daniel 11. Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40 says, and at, that, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south, this coalition of nations, push at him. And the king of the north, Gog and Magog, shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land. That's Israel. So this could be that same event but talking about the Antichrist moving in, and many countries shall be overthrown, like what happened in Ezekiel 38 and 39, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. He sets up his shop. He sets up his, his uh, um, fort, I guess you could say, in Israel. Yet he shall... He shall come to his end, and none shall help him. So this could be speaking of the Antichrist coming to Israel and setting up there. And he hears of these, this, these armies from the east that could be China. We know in Revelation there is going to be the, this army from the east coming this way, but they're hindered by the Euphrates River. And they're trying to think about how to get around it with their huge army. Do you know right now in China they have 100 million soldiers that, are, that can be ready at a moment's notice? And they're going to be marching their way, and it talks about this in Israel, and then the Euphrates River is going to be dried up. And then they're going to just march right across. And this is, they're going to be coming to Israel at the, to the plain of Megiddo. This is where the beast is. All these other armies, and you know... I mean, when, this, when these armies, Gog and Magog, and the southern coalition of nations are destroyed, either supernaturally or how it describes here, it could be from nuclear fallout or whatever, it's going to create that vacuum, and then all these other countries are going to be attracted to come there, and they are going to attack Israel. Israel's going to be a super world power at the time, and, he's, and they have an ally with the Antichrist, and, but then the Antichrist is going to turn on them. And all these countries are coming together for the last and final conflict. So that is what this could be talking about. He promised peace, but what happened? War. How many people are going to die? Two billion people. That's a lot of people that's going to die during this time period, during the tribulation. 
More is gonna, but at this time it talks about that many. So this is the red horse. Now the third seal, it's a black horse. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And behold, and lo, a black horse, and him that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. That scales, a pair of balances. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. A penny, that's speaking of a day's wage. A day's wage for a measure of wheat. A, you work all day just so you could feed your family one meal. Now, how much do you think it's going to cost to feed your family for a meal? A cheap meal, like oatmeal. Is oatmeal, that's not wheat, yeah? Cream of wheat. <laughs> or what is, I don't know. How much do you think it would cost to feed your family cream of wheat for one meal? How much? But how much would that cost in money-wise? Five dollars? Ten dollars? Now, if you're going to hire somebody, let's say a, an average worker's daily wage, someone's going to do a job or whatever, you, somebody that's skilled or makes decent money, how much do they make a day? I would say about $200 a day. Can you imagine spending $200 to feed your family cream of wheat? That's how bad it's going to be. You know, we were at the store. I forget what store it was. Yesterday, I went to so many stores. <laughs> It's a world's record for me to go to that many stores in one day. Six or seven stores we went to. I mean, some of them I just say, okay, I'll drop you off and I'll pick you up when you're done. <laughs> I, I didn't technically go into all these stores, but anyway. One of the stores we went to, we seen someone that had like tons and tons of toilet paper. And Roxanne was like, man, why do I have so much toilet paper? I said, because, you know, of all the stuff's going on. That's the first thing, like, you know, instead of grabbing food or... Important food, people grab toilet paper. <laughs> so, why? I'm not sure, but anyway, so toilet paper's going, right? In this day, I mean, we stress out about toilet paper. Can you imagine stressing out about just having food and having just the basic, simplest types of food so you can feed your family one meal? So what happens after war? Famine. So that's what, the black, that's what the black horse pictures. So it says, a black horse, a pair of balances, is going to be weighed out. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Now that's real, real cheap food. That's like what the animals eat. That's like you want to eat dog food. You know, I can get so much more dog food for a cheaper price. Can you imagine wanting to eat dog food? You know, I feed my dogs almost every day. Sometimes casing them, feed them. There's not one time ever in my career of feeding dogs that I ever thought, I wish I could eat this. How about you? No? But during this time period, it's going to be such a scarcity of food. People are going to want to eat what the animals eat. But then it says, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. That's what the rich people got. The rich people's stuff are not affected. See how there's a different class system? You notice how when those legislators from Texas were riding in a plane, none of them had masks on? You notice how at Obama's party, when you, if you see pictures of it, nobody had masks? There's a different rule. Do you know in the, the mandates for the, uh, the vaccine, it says that all the city workers have to ha be vaccinated on a, by a certain date? And all. I know right now they're going through, you know, I don't know if, it's, if it's, they're, they're still trying to push it or if they change the date or whatever. But where it talks about the people that are mandated, do you know, what it, do you know who it excludes? Elected officials. It doesn't apply to them. See, there's a different class system. That's one of the biggest problems with, among a lot of things, with communism. They say, oh, well, common for everyone, everybody can have the same. Oh, but then you got the upper echelon, the ones making all the rules. Oh, they're living in luxury. Corruption. A lot of the countries that are very poor have leaders who are very rich. The oil and the wine is not affected during these wars. There's someone else pushing the buttons. You know, a lot of times these wars that are going on, you got these people that are not sending their children to war. They're not fighting the wars themselves. They're creating all these wars, and all kind of people are dying and being affected, and they're in the back there just kind of make, making money. It's a very sick world that we live. And a lot of these wars are being fought just 
for people to get richer and richer, and they could care a less about the people that are dying. And that's what's going to happen in this time too. Hurt not the oil and the wine. Rich people's stuff is not affected. They just keep getting richer and richer. If you were to look, I don't want to, maybe I won't tell you this. I'm going to anyway. If you were to look at the amount of billionaires there are in this world, now, as compared to before the pandemic, it'll blow your mind. There was only, I think, one person that was close to $100 billion. There's like six now that have over $100 billion. The amount of billionaires has increased big time. Boom. People are struggling financially. People are losing their jobs. But the rich, the upper echelon, they keep getting richer and richer and richer. Follow the money in all of this, and you will have a lot of answers. Follow the money. How do those in Congress who make, you know, Couple two, three hundred thousand a year have hundreds of millions of dollars in their banks. There's no way they could have made that just with their job. Follow the money. Anyway, so that's kind of what's going on here. It just gets worse and worse. Do you know that these horsemen, maybe I'll read this last. Yeah, I won't go into it now. I'll read this last. The fourth seal. Verse 7, and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell. Death and hell followed with him. Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. The fourth part of the earth. So you have... The Antichrist promising a false peace, but they don't really get peace. He promises peace, but he delivers war, just like the prodigal son. He wanted prime rib. It's almost like the devil is dangling the prime rib, just like he did to Eve, right? He's, he's telling her that if she eats of this fruit, she's going to know good and evil. She's going to be like God. And he promises that you're going to expand your horizons. And when she partook of it, she fell into sin. And, he prom- and the prodigal son, he's probably dangling prime rib. You're going to be eating prime rib. He promises prime rib, but he gives him pig slop. He promises peace, but he delivers war. He's a deceiver. We need to remember that about sin. It's deceptive. Just like Samson sitting at the feet of Delilah and thinking that she actually loves him and she's trying to kill him. And he puts his head in her lap. And pretty soon he's what? Dead. So we see false peace, then we see war, then we see famine, then we see death, and then we see hell. A fourth part. There are almost 8 billion people out there today in the world, like 7.8 billion people. By this time, who knows, how, probably going to be about 8 billion or so, one, one fourth. They're going to die, and most of them are going to hell through the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when you look up that word in the Greek, because I speak Greek almost fluently. No, not really. I speak pidgin Greek. This word beast can also be translated into virus. How's that? I mean, we're, are we not very familiar with viruses today? Except these viruses, to me, right back here, well, all these people dying is going to be even worse. I mean, the coronavirus, they're saying, you, you really, it's like your chance of survival of getting it is nine, nine point, like nine, unless you have certain uh, underlining conditions or the older people, then it's less than that. But I think the lowest is even 98%. But this right here, I mean, there's going to be two billion people die. The Antichrist is coming. War is coming. Devastation is coming. Death is coming. And what follows death is hell. No soul sleep. Death and then hell. Then the fifth seal. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. These are the martyrs and for the testimony which he, which they held. Some believe that this is the, all the martyrs that had ever died. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell in the earth? 
It says they are un- the blood of them. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. Under the altar. The altar is the place where the sacrifice was made. And the blood went, dripped there. It flowed at the bottom of the altar. That's where these martyrs are. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou now judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants, there's going to be more, also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. There's going to be more martyrs to come. There may be many martyrs that's going to, many people are going to be martyred very soon in Afghanistan. Some already have. Are those that are taking a stand for their, for their faith. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Maybe we'll get that honor and the privilege of taking a stand for our faith that will cost our life. Right now, sometimes it's just maybe you get um, opposition or people get upset or don't want to hear what you got to say. There might be a day where it may cost us our life. And there have been many that have been put to death already. And they're crying, how long? The Antichrist is going to destroy all those who do not take the mark. By the way, I hope everyone in this room is saved. I hope everyone in this room, when the rapture takes place, you're going to be raptured. But if not, if you are left behind, do not, for any reason or circumstance, take the mark. Probably at the beginning of the tribulation, the mark will be voluntary, and then it will be mandatory. We've preached on this for years, and now we're seeing something that's mandatory right now. It's not the mark, don't get me wrong. But the stage is being set for the, I guess you could say, for the infrastructure to be there. Please don't go around saying the vaccine is. We got enough things going (laughs) going on and someone to start saying that. The mark is not some medicine or something like that. It is a mark. It's the mark of the beast. 666. And if someone asks you if it's a mark, tell them, no, it is not. That's ridiculous. But the mark of the beast will be volunteered probably at first, and it's going to be mandatory. And those that do not take the mark will not be allowed to do business, purchase food, or do anything. They'll be starved, they'll be hunted down, they'll be tortured, and they will be killed. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 18 speaks about it. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many... As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. We are already being accustomed to this right now. Beep. Right? How many have had somebody you go to a restaurant and go, okay, I got to take your temperature? Beep. It's already, it's a condition. The conditions, and it's also part of the infrastructure that's being set up. The technology is there. I'm not saying if you have a card or that that's the mark of the beast. It is going to be after we are raptured. But I'm just saying after the rapture occurs, if you are left behind or if you know someone who's not saved, let them know and then tell them, please, no matter what happens, do not take a, Once you take the mark of the beast, you're going to hell. That's it. There's no coming back after that. It says... He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And I'm wondering, why would someone want to take, like if they said, okay, you want to take the mark? Yeah, I want to take the mark. Okay, where do you want? You want it in your, your, your hand or your forehead? Why would they want it in? <laughs> I want it in my forehead. Then I thought, well, maybe it's because some people don't have a hand, maybe. And that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So the altar, the altar is a place that the blood of the sacrifice would flow. That's where the souls of the martyrs are. These souls in heaven cry out for vengeance. They are crying out to God to revenge their blood. When, When God's people are persecuted, he will set it right one day. It's not wrong that they cry to him out for vengeance. He promised to do so from the blood of Abel that cried out from the ground for vengeance in Genesis chapter 4, as did the blood of the avenged murders, the unavenged murders in the land of Israel. Their their blood cried out from from the ground. 
These saints are instructed to wait. How long will they have to wait? Well, there's going to be more that are going to be martyred. And when all those that are martyred, then at that point, then God will take revenge. It's in his timing. Then the sixth seal. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the sun and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the dens of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Even at that point, they still didn't cry out to him for salvation. So the sixth seal, the great earthquake, the sun becomes black, the moon becomes like blood, the stars seem to be falling because of the earthquake. So up until this point, we see that the judgments have been coming down from God through mankind, war, famine, disease, death, and martyrdom. But now we see God send an extremely powerful earthquake. The judgments are coming straight from the throne from God. The coming storm, the storm was approaching as John saw when he looked at him that sat on the throne. And now the storm is upon the earth. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 14 through 16 says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and, ha and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, and a, dis a day of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and, a and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. Joel chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong and executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? This is known as a day of the Lord, a time period of judgment. And that's what's going on. We see that uh, some of this could even be described in a nuclear war. And the world tries to hide from the wrath of God. Rather than receive him, they just want to hide from him. Remember Adam in the garden? He's trying to hide. We as believers are promised that we will be delivered from the wrath to come. We won't be here. We won't be at this, on earth at this time. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of to come as it says there it says for the great day of his wrath is come who shall be able to stand first thessalonians 5 9 for god hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord jesus christ only the believer can stand before this great judgment the one who is justified by grace through faith in jesus christ look at matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24, and you'll see here in Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus is talking about the end times, you'll see these horses. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Said unto, and, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that there shall be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That's what horse? That's the white horse, the Antichrist. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Who's that? What horse is that? That's the red horse. Right? See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And then it says, there shall be famines. What horse is that? That's the black horse famine with the, with the um, scales. 
and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. These are the beginning of sorrow, and they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. There's going to be many that are dead. And we see there, of course, of course, the last horse, the pale horse of death. And we see, of course, the, also the seals that are open, the martyrs. And we, of course, already seen in here the earthquakes. So Jesus is already telling them what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 6, right here in Matthew chapter 24. Now, is this talking to the church, Matthew tw chapter 24? Is Matthew 24, if you're thinking, this is talking about the sixth seal. Is this chapter talking about the church and getting us ready for the rapture? No. This is talking to the Jews that are going through the tribulation period that need to know this. Who's going to be deceived? Is the If someone came today and said, I am the Messiah, is anybody in this room going to be thinking, I wonder if that's the Messiah? No. Who is looking for the Messiah? The Jews. This is for the Jews to know. Many have been confused. That's why there's a lot of mid-tribbers, because Matthew 24 has been taught wrong by a lot of people. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. There's many during the tribulation period. They cannot receive the mark. They've got to endure to the end. And if, and if, they, don't re, and if they don't receive the mark and they get their head chopped off, that's fine because they go to heaven. Do not receive the mark if you are not raptured or if you know someone that's not saved tell them do not receive the mark under any circumstances is the vaccine a mark no but during the tribulation period there is going to be a mark and if you don't take it you can't buy or sell this time period is coming and we as believers need to warn the lost world Revelation chapter 6. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.